solar output. These criticals for reducing our carbon footprint. At, at present, 70% of our global energy is uh, created from fossil fuels, which uh, when burned, end up damaging our environment and our atmosphere. Solar energy, however, is one of the most abundant renewable energy sources. But the problem is that predicting solar energy production levels is extremely difficult due to fluctuations in new in environmental factors that affect its production. If we can accurately predict solar power production, then we can match energy supply with consumption, limit the energy wasted, and reduce overall cost, and make and make flexible energy production from various sources commercially feasible and integratable with the rest of the world. Let's see why we should use machine learning. Machine learning is an area of AI that is capable of uh, basically using machine learning models to learn from past input and output in a data set. And in our case, these features or types of data are going to include things like solar radiation, wind speed, and air temperature. Our output that we will be measuring is the predicted energy output per megawatt. Estimating output from a solar grid might be very difficult for a human, but with a correct training machine learning model, it's very easy and extremely accurate. So let's take a quick look at our flow chart. Right here, we can see the, uh, all the numerous factors that we're taking in, or the features, uh, including wind speed, sunshine, and air pressure over a 24-hour period. We're taking all of this data and putting it into a fully connected deep neural network, which basically does uh, a, a lot of mathematical operations on all of this data all at once to predict our solar energy output for the following hour. When it comes to our model parameters, the IDE we ended up using was the laboratory number of epics. The iterations of training our data was uh, we initially started with 5,000, but just decided 200 would be fine. The number of neurons, or basically not function, was initially set to 512, and we brought it down to 256. The number of hidden layers was set, uh, or the groups of neurons uh, decided to stay, we decided to keep it at four per stack. And the number of stacks, or the group of identical layers, repeated with different parameters, um, was initially set to 30, but we brought it down to two. And while these number of differences might seem dramatic, they ended up having almost no impact on performance. So let's see our uh, data analysis right here. We can see some important correlations. First of all, uh, during the noontime hours, we tend to see higher power generation as expected. And in the in the summer months, there was uh, higher system production radiation and sunshine. And overall, we can also see a negative correlation with a relative air humidity to solar power generated. So before I jump into our demonstration, I'm just going to be going over some of the data that we collected. So this blue section right here is basically all our training data, or what we used to give our model a better uh, idea of what to estimate. And this uh, red right here is what we use as a validation data to actually test our model's real performance. So if we go over to our model, we can see from here that we started off by importing libraries and uh, we took in our data and we did lots of different data processing on it. And ultimately we ended up seeing a model that looks something like this diagram. Essentially what it does is it takes in all of these layers and passes it through a neural network, uh, in a dense neural network and does numerous mathematical operations on it to get more and more accurate results. Now it also uses this n beats block function, which is useful for measuring time frame uh, with recursive uh, deep learning models. And this basically ended up giving us our final output in megawatts. So right here we can see our model being trained. It looks something like this, but we're not going to train it right now for the brevity of this presentation. So right here we can see this graph that shows our training loss and our validation loss. Loss is basically how inaccurate our program is, our model is. So as we train it, we can see that it's consistently going down with data that's already given. But when we give a data that hasn't already been given, or the red right here, the validation loss that I was talking about earlier, this right here ended up being just under 100 uh, megawatts on average that is uh, not, predict not predicting correctly. Considering how little data we had, which is uh, less than a year, this is fairly accurate because it didn't even have data to train on the winter months. So we can see from here that um, obviously our model is fairly accurate even without that much data. But obviously more data is always better. So right here we can see 120 hidden layers versus eight hidden layers. Uh, and this is basically, uh, as I mentioned before, how many times it's iterating through this data. So in terms of epics, at 100 epics, they ended up having roughly the same performance. Note that the scale here is 700, the scale here is 300. Since they had roughly the same data, there's no point in computing it even more. This was simply a waste of time and computing resources. Right here is just a graph that shows you roughly how and after our model was over time. And from here, we conclude that the, our, the machine learning model uh, that we've developed is can be easily implemented to accurately predict solar power production. Companies only need to collect the data to train them model. And the machine learning model can be generalized for other renewable resources. Let's take a look at the benefits. First, energy companies. They can now spend less on fuels and no longer have to create redundant energy from non renewable sources. Customers now can pay less because companies don't have to buy as much fossil fuel. The, the planet sees a reduction in fossil fuel consumption, making the world a better and healthier place for everyone. Thank you so much for watching.